Hello guys, Colonel Ninny here. Piloting is not limited to your ability to fly the aircraft well. And nor is it limited to your expertise in aerial gunnery. There is another factor that we have to consider and that's your ability to be able to read a map and navigate to and from your target. Navigation is a centuries-old topic and I'm going to give you some background in it so you understand that finding our position on the planet is not that easy. And then we're going to simplify it by using the tools that they had during World War I to fly on the Western Front. When I started flying, maps looked pretty much like this. And a few years before I was born, they used to use this thing called the cross staff to see where the sun was. And using magical and demonic powers, they could figure out where they were. Skip forward a couple of hundred years, and they came up with the astrolobe, which could identify their position in relation to the stars. And from this machine, we derived the modern sextant, which is still in use today. Using a book called the Nautical Almanac, which lists numerous celestial bodies and their positions above the horizon at every point of the day in the year. By taking a couple of different sites, you could triangulate your position on the globe. And that position is given in latitude and longitude. And with this, we can positively identify our exact position with relation to a latitude and a longitude coordinate. And the global positioning system, the GPS, triangulates in exactly the same way. Except instead of using the stars, it uses satellites. The problem these days with GPS is that nobody needs to learn how to read a map. In fact, GPS stops us from thinking about where we're going. Turn left in 300 meters. Take the right lane and exit on the right. All we have to do is follow the direction. No thinking involved. So as a pilot in World War I, you'd better be thinking about your navigation or you won't get home. There's also a difference between true north and magnetic north because they're not located in the same place. And as latitude and longitude is based on true north, we have to add or subtract the difference to get our magnetic heading. And up in the Arctic, the magnetic heading is almost useless. But we're not in the Arctic, we're in France on the Western Front. It's 1917. And the only navigation tools you have are a compass and a clock. But fortunately, that's all you need. So let's take a look now at the map that we have to work with in Flight Circus. There's neither latitude nor longitude represented. Instead, we have a grid system, which makes positioning in the game relatively simple. Each grid square represents an area of 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers, identified by the number in its center. The distance between Arras in 0706 to Douai in 0608 is less than three grid squares, or about 30 kilometers. And each grid square is broken up into nine subsectors. The position of this railway bridge could be considered as grid square 0508, keypad 4. So what is the grid coordinate for merlin Lassac airfield? And what is the coordinate for the Breville airfield? What is the distance between the two airfields? So, how long would it take us to fly 56 kilometers at, say, 112 kilometers an hour? There's a very simple calculation for time and distance. We've just calculated the distance and we know the speed at which the airplane will fly. And from this, the reasonable answer is about 30 minutes. Longer if there's a headwind, shorter if there's a tailwind. 
Let's take a look now at the different landmarks that are on the map. These are features that are easily recognizable by the pilot from the air as he or she is flying over them. The most prominent of these is the front line, which is the dirty, bombed out, muddy area that runs basically north and south. And this is probably your best directional reference. We talked earlier about triangulating your position. So before we use the compass, I'm going to show you a very practical method to identify our position in relation to known ground objects. It's called the clock positioning method. And we assume that our aircraft is in the center of the clock flying towards the 12. And if we see something off to the left like this, it would be in the 11 o'clock position. Off our left wing, the town would be at the 9 o'clock position, while the town ahead would be at 12 o'clock and the armored units at 4 o'clock. By lining up the tanks at 4 o'clock with the tanks at 10 o'clock, you know that you're somewhere in between the two. Let's look now at using the compass. As we've seen, it tells us our direction in relation to magnetic north and is split up into north, south, west, and east, or ost if you're German. The compass rose is split into 360 degrees. And in modern aircraft, it's easy to hold a heading, for example, 015. But for practical purposes in flying circuits, we're going to be able to hold the headings in between the cardinal headings, northwest, southwest, southeast, and northeast. You'll be heading in the general direction, but not with great accuracy. It's another reason you need to be good at navigating and map reading. If we plan to fly from the airfield in 0807 to 0407, what's the heading? And if we turn to our 9 o'clock and flew to 0804, what would be our heading? Once we arrive in La Herlier, we want to fly to 0503 Brias. What would our general heading be there? What have we learned? Hopefully, we've learned to visually identify an object on the map and then identify its geolocated position on the map with grid coordinates 0504 keypad 9, for example. And this, in turn, will help us to determine our position in relation to several objects through triangulation. And more importantly, you are now able to fly to and from a location based on a compass heading. This is called navigation. In lesson 12, we are going to use these navigational skills to identify the target on the map and find it from the air and attack it. If you've enjoyed this video and get some value out of it, please leave a comment and uh, subscribe and like and all those usual things. But if you want to see more of these videos, specifically with the IL-2 uh, Battle of Stalingrad, I've got about 150 training videos for you to look at. So thanks for watching guys, we'll see you next time.